A number of patterns exist in electron flow and organic reaction mechanisms, and we're going to explore some of these patterns in this lesson. In this introductory webcast, what I wanted to do is just take a couple of minutes to introduce you to the general classes of organic transformations so we can get a feel for how to classify reactions themselves without necessarily digging into their mechanisms. What we find is that reactions in the same class often have analogous mechanisms, and so we can make connections between reactions that we've seen before and new reactions that we encounter. So on this slide, you see a list of seven general classes of organic reaction mechanisms, and I wanted to go through them quickly to jog your memory on these and introduce you to some specific examples. So the first example in the top left is the acid-base reaction between a base which typically has a non-bonding lone pair that is reactive, that's looking for a nucleus, and an acid which has an XH bond with a low energy LUMO such that the XH bond wants to break to form X with a lone pair, which becomes the conjugate base of HX in the products, and an acid, HY. So the lone pair on Y picks up a proton from the base. Since the net reaction is the transfer of H plus from X to Y, this is an acid-base reaction. Two and three are oxidation and reduction. And these reactions involve the replacement of a bond to a heteroatom, which you see on the left here as CX, to a bond to hydrogen, which you see as CH. So the replacement of CX for CH is called reduction because it corresponds to a reduction in the oxidation state of the carbon atom. And the reverse process, the replacement of H for X, is called oxidation. The mechanisms can be somewhat complex, but the basic idea is the replacement of CX bonds for CH bonds and vice versa. Substitution is the generic replacement of a bond CX for a new bond CY. The group Y replaces X, and we can break substitution down into two general classes. We can think about nucleophilic substitution, in which the incoming group Y is a nucleophile, something with a good electron source, and CX is a good electrophile. Or we can think about electrophilic substitution, where the group Y is an electrophile, and the CX bond is actually nucleophilic, so for whatever reason, particularly often when X is a metal, the CX bond is very high energy and wants to donate electrons toward Y. From the perspective of the carbon, that's an electrophilic substitution. We're replacing one electrophilic group, X, with another electrophilic group, Y. In a future webcast in this lesson, we'll look at nucleophilic and electrophilic reaction conditions in more detail, particularly in the context of substitution. Elimination and addition are different from substitution because they involve the incorporation or the removal of groups. Elimination involves the loss of the elements X and Y from the compound with the formation of a pi bond, typically. So the idea is that the starting material, which you see on the left, has two single bonds, and the products contain a new single bond between X and Y and a double or triple bond between the groups C and Z. That's elimination, and it's called that because the group XY is eliminated from the organic compound. The reverse process is the addition of the elements XY across the CZ bond. This may involve either nucleophilic or electrophilic addition. In other words, the incoming reagent XY may either be a nucleophile, we call that nucleophilic addition, or an electrophile. The last class of reactions are rearrangement reactions, and these involve changes in the structure of the molecular skeleton without the addition or elimination of any atoms to the structure. Many rearrangement reactions take place through mechanisms that are comparable to substitutions, additions, and eliminations, but some stand on their own. For example, the pericyclic reactions that correspond to rearrangements, like the electrocyclic reactions and the sigmatropic rearrangements, these don't really involve substitution and elimination. They just involve changes in the positions of bonds and potentially lone pairs. For that reason, we classify rearrangements on their own because they may not necessarily involve polar intermediates and may be concerted. Armed with these seven classes of reactions, as I mentioned at the beginning of this webcast, we can begin to classify reactions according to this paradigm. And in the search for a reasonable reaction mechanism for a particular transformation, Understanding which class the reaction falls into is one of the first important steps that we can take 
to develop a reasonable reaction mechanism. And the idea ultimately is to develop analogies between reactions in that class that we've seen already and the new reaction before us.